A Dialogue of Polygamy by Bernardino Ochino. A Dialogue of Polygamy between Tele Polygamus and Ochinus. I desire your advice, which because I conceive you are both able and willing to afford me, therefore it is, I address myself unto you. Ochinus. I am indeed willing, provided it be within the reach of my understanding and ability. Tele Polygamus. In the first place, I beg of you that you will faithfully promise to keep my counsel. Achenus, I am content if I may do it without dishonouring God. Telepolygamus, I have a wife not suitable to my mind, so that I cannot love her, and as far as I can perceive she is both barren and unhealthful, and I find myself so disposed that I cannot want the company of a woman. Also, I desire to have children, both for posterity's sake and that I may instruct them in the fear of God. I could indeed keep a concubine or two, but my conscience will not suffer me. Also, I could falsely charge my wife with adultery, and so put her away, but in so doing I should both offend God and blemish mine own and my wife's reputation, which I will not do. I could also poison her, which is a thing I abhor. But a thought is come into my mind to take another wife, so as to keep her that I have already, notwithstanding, and I conceive God has put this into my mind, and that I am thereunto called by him, my desire, therefore, is that you will tell me whether, according to the word of God, I may lawfully do it. Ochinus. In doubtful cases, it is fit to take advice, but the case is clear that a man ought not to have more wives than one, because the condition of marriage is such that it cannot be between more than two. Telepolygamus. How can you make that appear? Ochinus. God, at the beginning, made out of Adam only one woman, and gave her to him, signifying that he ought to have but one, and that matrimony ought to be only of two persons. If he would have had a man to have more wives, he would doubtless have made him more, especially at the beginning of the world, where propagation was more necessary than ever afterwards. Telepolygamus. I conceive this argument is of small validity. God gave to our first father Adam one wife, therefore it is unlawful for any man to have more. Achenus, if it had been the will of God that he should have more, he would have given him more, especially in the state of perfection wherein he was pleased to put him. Telepolygamus, a bare act of God, without any precept added thereunto, does not oblige us to imitate the same, for if so, then we are bound to wear coats of skin, because God so clothed our first parents, and it were unlawful to wear cloth or silk, for your argument would always be of force. God clothed them with skins, and he could have clothed them with cloth or silk, if it had been his pleasure that men should be so clothed, if an act of God alone do bind us as much as a precept, so that God's giving Adam one wife only were as much in effect as if he had said to him, I will and command that every man have one wife only, it would follow that not only it should be unlawful for a man to have more wives than one, but that every man that did not take a wife, it being in his power so to do, should sin, which is contrary to the doctrine of St. Paul. Achenus. You must understand that Paul is not contrary to God. For in that God gave only one wife to Adam, it was all one as if he had said, I would not have a man to have more wives than one, and it is my pleasure that he have one, unless I shall call him to a single life, and give him the gift of chastity, and that is the intent of Paul. Telepolygamus. And I, for my part, must say that when God gave Adam one wife, it was as if he had said, It is my pleasure that a man shall have one wife, if either he shall want the gift of continency, or I shall call him to a married condition. It is also my pleasure that I shall have no more, unless he stand in need of more, or I shall call him to more, which is at this time my condition, who stand in need of, and am called to marry another. Achenus. That a single life is pleasing to God, the word of God shows. But we are not thereby taught that he is pleased men should have more than one wife. Achenus. Nay, verily, both God's word and the saint's example do reach the same, as we shall show by and by. But go to, suppose it had been God's pleasure that every man should have so many wives as it was possible for him rightly to govern and instruct together with their children. How many wives must he have given Adam thereby to signify his pleasure in this point? Achenus, you suppose that which cannot be, seeing that having more wives than one is repugnant to true matrimony. Telepolygamus. You have not yet made it clear to me that to have more wives than one is repugnant to marriage, otherwise than by saying that God gave one to Adam. 
Let us now suppose he had given him more. Doubtless from that first institution you could not prove that a man ought not to have more, nay, it would follow of necessity that a man might have more. How many wives, therefore, in such a case, had it been necessary for God to give Adam to signify his pleasure in this point? Achenus, two would have been enough. Telepolygamus, now then, if that action of his had been a precept, as you say, it would have been unlawful for men to have had more or less than two wives, which, nevertheless, would not have been answerable to his will, seeing his intent was that they should have as many as they could govern. We must therefore confess that by a bare act of God, no command being added, we are not obliged to the imitation thereof. Otherwise it would be a sin for a minister to celebrate the Lord's Supper unless the communicants were just so many in number as the apostles of Christ were when he instituted the same. Achenus, although it does not necessarily follow that because God gave one wife to Adam, therefore it is unlawful for a man to have more, yet it is doubtless a very probable argument to persuade, and urges strongly, though it be not altogether compulsive. Telepolygamus, Nay, verily, it urges not at all, since it may be said that God gave one wife to Adam, not to show that his will was that every man should have but one wife, but that the rest of mankind, being born as well of one mother as one father, might love one another so much the more, also that Eve, being made of the rib of Adam, might be a figure of the holy church, the only spouse of Christ. Achenus, go to, let us come unto the words of the text. Do you not think that Adam was moved by divine instinct when he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife? Telepolygamus, without doubt. Achenus, do you not see how in saying he shall cleave to his wife, not wives, he teaches us that a man is to have but one? Telepolygamus, very good. When God commands a man to love his neighbor, does he oblige him to love one or more? Achenus, all that are his neighbors. Telepolygamus, that's false, for he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor, not thy neighbors. And therefore, whoever loves one of his neighbours has fulfilled that command. Achenus, Christ, when he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour, spoke it in this sense, as if he should have said, Thou shalt love every one that is thy neighbour. Telepolygamus, so likewise Adam, when he said, He shall cleave unto his wife, did intimate that he should cleave unto every one that shall be his wife, and therefore, here there is a lacuna in the text, not be proved by those words that it is unlawful for a man to have more wives than one. Achenus, but what will you say to those following words of his, and of them twain shall be made one flesh? For he does not say of three or four. From these words it is doubtless manifest that God would not have marriage to be made between more than two. Telepolygamus, Adam says not that of them two shall be made one flesh, but they shall be made one flesh. Achenus, but that was his meaning, as plainly appears from the words of Christ, who, citing the said speech, says that God by Adam declared, They too shall be one flesh, adding, moreover, this following clause, They are no longer two, but one flesh. Telepolygamus, it is as if he had said, The husband shall love every one of his wives as if she were the same flesh, and the same body with him, and so likewise shall every wife love her husband. Achenus, but God said, they too shall be one, therefore they cannot be three or four. Telepolygamus, you were in the right if he had said, they too only shall be one. And therefore, as this argument is of no force, Christ said, if two of you on earth shall agree about a thing, they shall obtain what they ask. Therefore, if three or four shall agree, they shall not obtain the same. So is this no good inference. God said, they too shall be one flesh. Therefore, if there be three, it is no true marriage. Hokinus, it is impossible for more than two to become one flesh. Telepolygamus. In the primitive church, there were not only two believers, but they were in great numbers, having nevertheless one soul and one mind, and you believe, if a man had diverse wives, he could not become one flesh with them? If a man, while he cleaves unto an harlot, becomes, as Paul says, one body with her, although he have a wife, should he not much more become one flesh with her, if he should make her his wife? Achenus. Say what you will, to have more than one wife is a thing filthy, dishonest, and quite contrary and destructive to the holy state of matrimony. Telepolygamus. And yet you know that Abraham had more wives than one, as also David, and many other men under the Old Testament, who, in case it had been unlawful for them to have more than one wife, they should have sinned in marrying diverse women, and the children which they had by all their wives, excepting the first, should have been bastards, because not begotten in lawful matrimony. Achenus. 
I will sooner grant all that you have said than I will allow, or grant it lawful for one man to have more than one wife. Those ancients were holy men, yet did they sometimes sin. They were sinners, as being born of Adam, as appears in the example of David, and they should have deceived themselves if they had denied themselves to be sinners. Telepolygamous. That they sometimes sinned I shall easily grant, but I will never yield that they continued in their sins till their day of death, which nevertheless they did, in case it was unlawful for them to have diverse wives. Whence it would follow that they were all damned, as those who die while they keep a concubine. As for us, we cannot hold them for saints, seeing we know not for certain that they ever repented. When David had committed those same acts of adultery and murder, because he was one of God's elect, God sent his prophet to him to reprove him, as also when he numbered the people, contrary to the command of God. Credible, therefore, it is that if to have diverse wives had been contrary to the law of God, God would have used the like proceedings towards him, that he might not be damned. But though you read the whole Bible over, you shall never find that God has forbade the having of diverse wives. And yet, if it had been a thing unlawful, Moses would never have dissembled the matter. Moreover, the Scriptures tell us that David was a man after God's own heart, and that he was obedient to all the Lord's commandments all his life long, save in the matter of Uriah. So that, had it been a sin to have diverse wives, seeing that also had been sufficiently known, the author would have accepted it, or he must doubtless make himself a liar by saying that David committed only that sin of homicide under which his adultery is comprehended. Again, how could that be true, which God said to David when blaming him for his unthankfulness? He told him that he had given him many wives, which, questionless, must have been all whores except the first, and so it had not been God but the devil that gave them unto him. Moreover, you shall find that God made a law that if any man had two wives, the one beloved and the other hated, and had by them diverse children, the eldest of which was the son of the hated wife, it should not be allowed the father to make the son of his beloved wife his heir, now it might fall out that the beloved wife might be his first wife, and so it should come to pass that, though the husband had children by the latter, sooner than by the first, yet they should be bastards, if your opinion be true, and born of an whore, and therefore ought not to be heirs. It is therefore clear by the word of God that all the children are legitimate, though sprung from diverse wives, by one and the same husband, and that therefore not only the first, but the following marriages are lawful, seeing God did both approve and bless them in those holy men, the first fathers of the world. Achenus, the first thing which you say follows from my opinion, that all which died, having many wives, should be damned, I answer, if they are dead, not having divorced all save their first wife, or without repenting of their sin, they are all damned. But as many of them, as are saved, did repent, and put away all but their first and lawful wife. Telepolygamous, but it is not apparent that ever any did that. And yet, if your opinion were true, mention ought to have been made thereof in the Holy Scriptures, that we might know and understand that to keep diverse wives is an abominable thing. Achenus, it was already known that men ought not to have more wives than one, because God had commanded that the husband and the wife should of two become one flesh. Telepolygamus, it is not likely that it was unlawful to have diverse wives, and that the unlawfulness thereof was known, and Abraham, and Jacob, and David, and other worthy persons like them, should nevertheless marry more wives than one. Achenus, that's a good one, as if many holy men in ancient times did not sin, though they knew what they did was unlawful. Telepolygamus, but they did not continue to their lives end in those sins, as those that married more wives than one did. Achenus, I told you before that if they were of the number of God's elect, they did at last repent. Telepolygamus, but we ought no longer to reckon the patriarchs, for example's sake, to be saints, seeing we are assured that they sinned in having many wives, but we are not assured of their repentance. Achenus, true, unless the word of God assures us that they were saints, as we know, for example's sake, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be saints, because Christ said that many should come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now I conceive that, as Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts, suffered the Jews to put away their wives without just cause, so for the same cause he suffered them to have sundry wives, that is to say, he did not forbid or hinder it, nor punish the same by any law enacted in his commonwealth. But it follows not, therefore, that they did not sin in God's sight, and that they did not deserve punishment unless they repented. Telepolygamus, that thing is permitted which is neither punished, nor hindered, nor forbidden. Truly, I will not say Moses sinned, if to avoid a greater evil and to comport with the hardness of the Jews' hearts, he permitted them to have diverse wives. That is to say, he did not punish or hinder them, but if he permitted them, so as not to forbid them, I cannot but say he sinned. 
For Moses ought to have expressly forbidden that any man should have more than one wife, which, because he has not done, we must needs confess that it is not a thing unlawful. Ogenus, the having of many wives, was then, as it is now, so apparently filthy, dishonest, and vicious, that it was needless for Moses to forbid the same. Telepolygamus, and it was not apparent that adultery was a thing filthy, dishonest, vicious, yea, much more than the having of many wives, and yet he expressly forbade adultery. And in case it had been unlawful to have many wives, he ought to have forbidden that, so much the more expressly by how much the unlawfulness thereof was less manifest than the unlawfulness of adultery was. Is it not a clear case that homicide is unlawful, and yet he forbids that? In a word, what are the Ten Commandments but an expression of the law of nature? Achenus, it may be said that God might remit the transgressions against the second table because he is above, not only all creatures but his own law, and peradventure he might remit the same to all mankind born before the death of Christ, and consequently be willing that they might have more wives than one without sin. And so it comes to pass that those under the Old Testament that had many wives did not sin, and under that consideration God might give many wives to David, though it may also be said that he gave them to him that is permitted him to have them, inasmuch as he neither hindered nor punished him. Telepolygamus, that it is lawful to keep more wives than one, if your opinion be true, is clear from the word of God, who said that two should be made one flesh. But that God did so far remit of his laws, that men should not sin in having more, does not appear in the word of God. That opinion, therefore, of yours has no foundation. Ochenus, if you consider well, you shall find that Lamech, a very wicked man, was the first that had two wives. Other holy men that preceded him, knowing the will of God, had only one apiece. Telepolygamus, as if that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not more holy than those very men you speak of, but in the first place I cannot tell how you came to know that Lamech was the first man that had two wives, although he be the first man whom the scripture mentions to have two. But as this is a vain argument, the scripture nowhere mentions that Cain had more than one son, therefore doubtless he had no more, so as vain is this which follows. It is nowhere in scripture recorded that those men that lived before Lamech had more wives than one, therefore none of them had above one wife. Moreover, where it is said that Lamech had two wives, it is not charged upon him as a sin, but seems rather to be set down as a thing pleasing to God, that a man should have more wives than one, seeing by them he gave Lamech such ingenious sons as proved the inventors of arts, both delightful and profitable. Neither can I see how you came informed that Lamech was so wicked a man as you talk of. Achenus, God plagued him by suffering him to fall into the sins of murder and desperation only because he married two wives. Telepolygamus, but I cannot see either that he was a murderer or fell into despair. Neither does the scripture teach any such thing, if it be rightly interpreted, or if the scripture had intimated any such thing, which I do not grant. Yet does it not thereby appear that God suffered him so to slip because he had married two wives? Achenus, but we may conjecture that his having two wives displeased God, seeing his murder is presently after mentioned. Telepolygamus, in the first place, I have already told you that by the words of that text, if they be rightly understood, there is no signification made that either he was a manslayer or in desperation, and if such a thing were intimated, it does not therefore follow that his plurality of wives was the cause thereof, or that God was offended with him therefore. Inasmuch as presently upon the mention of his two wives he commends their sons, as if he would give us to understand that he approves of plurality of wives. Add thereunto that nothing ought to be affirmed or avouched in the church of God, as necessary to salvation, if it cannot otherwise be known, save by conjectures only. Ochenus, seeing I cannot convince you out of the Old Testament, I will try what I can do from the New. Telepolygamus, you are in an error if you think the Old Testament is not sufficient to teach us all things necessary to salvation. If therefore that be the cause you betake yourself to the New, you are deceived, seeing, as Paul writes, all scripture of divine inspiration is profitable for reprehension, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be made perfect, furnished for every good work. Now clear it is that Paul in that place speaks of those scriptures in which Timothy was exercised from a child, and because the New Testament was not then written, you must be forced to confess that Paul in that place speaks of the Old. The Old Testament, therefore, is profitable not only to assert the truth of such things as are necessary to salvation, but also to confute falsities, and consequently to render a man perfect. For which cause Christ, speaking thereof, said, Search the scriptures, for in them is found here there is a lacuna in the text. Life. Ochenus. 
perhaps some things are forbidden to us in the New Testament, which were not forbidden to them in the Old. Telepolygamous. In moral matters, verily, whatever is unlawful and to us forbidden, was in like manner ever more forbidden to them, and whatever was allowed and commanded to them, the same is in like manner allowed and commanded to us. God was equally the author of the Old Testament as well as of the New, nor was he ever contrary or unlike himself. Aquinas. That was allowed to those under the Old Testament because of their imperfection, which is not allowed to us in whom carnal desires ought to be much more mortified. Telepolygamous. You take that for granted, which you have not proved, viz. that it is unlawful to have more wives than one. Moreover, you are deceived if you think that it is a bad thing to have one wife, but worse, to have two. For as the act matrimonial in him that has one wife is a thing not in itself evil, nor repugnant to those actions that are necessary to salvation, no more is it to have two wives, provided a man have a call from God to marry them, and be moved not by the impulse of the flesh, but of the spirit, that he may have children, and bring them up in the fear of God, his wife likewise doing the same, whence it follows that he may be as perfect that has two wives, as he that has but one or none. Nor had Abraham, because he had diverse wives, less faith, hope, or charity, than priests, monks, or friars that have none. Conjugal chastity is as well the gift of God as that of a single state, for this cause Paul said, Every one is endued with his own gift from God, some one way, some another. Aquinas. In that place the apostle exhorted the Corinthians to a single life, and that for no other cause but that a married estate has many encumbrances attending the same. Inasmuch as married people, being entangled with worldly affairs, are not so free to pray and preach up and down and do good to others as single people are. Now, if so be the having of one wife, do bring so many impediments, any one may soon conjecture what the having of diverse wives will do, and therefore to have more wives than one is unlawful. Telepolygamous, you are in error if you think that the mind of Paul in those words was that marriage was a stop to men's journey to heaven so that married people could not be saved. For then that which God said would not be true, viz, that it was not good for a man to be alone, but it would rather be an excellent thing to be alone, and to marry a wife, the worst thing in the world, because in so doing a man should sin. Moreover, I add, that not only a married man may be saved, as well as a bachelor, but be as perfect as he, inasmuch as he may attain as great perfection in faith, hope, and charity as the other. And if he cannot personally perform some external works which the single man can, as hindered by his married estate, yet he may in mind perform the same, and that is it which God regards. Aquinas, though matrimony do not hinder a man from going to God, yet the having of more wives than one does. Telepolygamous, how prove you that? Aquinas, from Paul, who, speaking of bishops, says he would have them to be the husbands of one wife, meaning that they should have no more. It is therefore unlawful to have more wives than one. Telepolygamous, nay, rather, when he tells them by name that they should have one, lest having more, they should be too much distracted with worldly business, it is easy to see that he allows other men to have more. Aquinas. Some do thus interpret the mind of Paul. A bishop is to have but one wife, that is, say they, one church for his spiritual spouse. Telepolygamous. Many reasons show that to be a false opinion. First, because Christ is only the spouse of souls and bridegroom of his church, and if we that are ministers be his friends, we ought with John Baptist, as the friends of Christ, the only true spouse of souls, to send them to him, their bridegroom, and not to draw them to ourselves. The churches, therefore, of Christ are not the bishop's spouse, and if they were, as the husband is superior to his wife, so should they be to their respective churches, against which Paul writes to the Corinthians when he says, We are not lords over your faith, or over you by reason of your faith. The church, therefore, is not Paul's wife. I confess, indeed, that one church is enough for one pastor, and he does no small matter if he can govern that well. In the ancient times of Christianity, one church sometimes had diverse pastors, as appears from the epistle to the Philippians, in which Paul salutes the bishops, which were at Philippi, whereas nowadays one bishop has many churches. Moreover, when Paul says a bishop ought to have one wife, he speaks of the manner of him that was fit to be a bishop. But if he be yet to be chosen, he is no bishop, and therefore has no church as yet that might be called his wife. Hereby also it is manifest that by wife he did not mean church, because presently, almost after those words, he makes mention of his children, commanding that he govern his family well, and have his children subject to him with all reverence. For if a man cannot govern his own family, how can he oversee the church of God? In that place, therefore, he speaks of a wife, and not of a church. Aquinas. Some say that Paul in that place forbids such men to be chosen bishops, 
who have had diverse wives, though not at one and the same time. Telepolygamous. But I do not conceive that Paul counted it sin after the death of a man's first wife to take a second, for as much as he himself says that after the death of the husband the wife is free, and may, without blame, marry another. So far it is from being unlawful for a man after the death of his wife to marry another. Okinus. They say it is a shameful thing when a man's first wife is dead to marry another. Telepolygamous. If you weigh the matter rightly and follow not the opinion of the blind vulgar people, you shall find that the matrimonial act is as free from turpitude as the actions of eating and drinking, nor would God have commanded matrimony if it had been evil, which nevertheless he did when he said, increase and propagate. Okinus, I condemn not matrimony but the iteration or repetition thereof. Telepolygamus, the second matrimony is as true and valid as the first, and therefore you cannot condemn the iteration of matrimony, but you must with all condemn matrimony itself. Take an example. A young man marries a wife, she dies a few days after, he is somewhat incontinent, or is again called to a married condition. Who knows not that he is according to the precept of Paul, seeing he cannot contain, ought to take another wife. Hokinus Unless second marriages were filthy and unlawful, Paul would never, speaking afterwards of widows, have commanded such to be chosen as had only one husband. Telepolygamus. Think you that Paul was superstitious? Okinus. I do not think he was. Telepolygamus. If a young widow, somewhat incontinent, had asked Paul's advice, what think you Paul's answer would have been? Okinus. That she should marry again according to his own doctrine. Telepolygamus. It is not therefore unlawful to marry again. Why then should Paul reject such widows as had had more husbands than one? For it was possible that some widow, having had diverse husbands, might be holy and honest, than they which had had but one. Also it might fall out that she which had had diverse husbands might live but one year with them, whereas the rest, that had never more than one, might have lived with him thirty or forty years. In such a case truly I cannot see why they should be more worthy to be chosen than she. I do therefore believe that the mind of Paul in that place was this, that such widows were not to be chosen that had had many husbands, that is to say, who being divorced had married again, their former husbands, who divorced them being yet alive, for either they were divorced upon a just ground, and then it was not fit they should be chosen, or upon an unjust ground, and so the matrimony remained good, having never been violated, and then the divorced woman had sinned if she married to another by which means it came to pass that all women divorced were infamous, not only such as married to other men, but such likewise as abstained from marriage, and especially amongst the Gentiles, whom were not wont to divorce them, save for some fault or vicious quality. Paul therefore did never condemn those women, who, their former husband being dead, married another, nor did he forbid them to be bishops, who, their former wife being dead, married another, which notwithstanding these superstitious papists observed, because they understood not the meaning of Paul. Though a man have kept diverse whores, they make him a bishop, but if his first wife being dead he marry another, they will not. Whence it comes to pass that matrimony amongst them is of worse report than fornication, adultery, incest, sacrilege, sodomy, and all imaginable abominations. This is therefore the mind of Paul, and this will make the third opinion, as has been said of widows, that he who has had diverse wives, because he divorced one, ought not to be made a bishop. For if he divorced her unjustly, he ought not to be a bishop in that regard. If justly, yet the infamy of his wife redounding upon himself, for that cause, Paul would not have him to be a bishop. Howbeit, I like not this opinion, for he does not say he must have been, but that he must be the husband of one wife. For he says, he must be unblamed, viz. as the husband of one wife, as he expressed it a little afterwards touching deacons, and writing to Titus about bishops. Achenus because a bishop in regard of the public office he beareth, as also the deacons have to do with all persons, not only with men, but also with women, to avoid suspicion, Paul would, that they should be married, and this perhaps might be the meaning of those words. Also it may be that Paul, foreseeing the superstition of the papists, who would forbid the marriage of bishops that they might be without excuse, he said they ought to be blameless and to have a wife, but that they should have no more than one, he did not say. Or he shows that a bishop ought to have a wife, that is, he ought to be content with her and not have anything to do with other women, which is as if he had said that he ought to be honest. Telepolygamous. The mind of Paul is this, that it is lawful for the generality of Christians to have many wives, but for bishops to only have 
every man one, not because it had been a sin for them to have more, but because the duty of bishops being to labour for the salvation of others, he feared lest multiplicity of wives should be a pullback and hinder them from performing their office as they ought to do. For this cause he would have them to have but one, nor is it therefore unlawful for other men to have more. Yea, verily, while he forbids bishops and deacons to have more than one, he closely allows it to other men. Nor is it likely Paul would have forbidden bishops to have more wives than one, had it not been the custom of those times for them to have more. It was therefore in the New Testament forbidden to bishops to have many wives, as it was in the Old Testament forbidden to kings, not because it was in itself unlawful, but lest kings whose office was of greatest consequence, being distracted by their wives, should be corrupted, as it happened to Solomon. For if Adam, when he had but one, was notwithstanding perverted by her, it is easy to conjecture what might happen to kings if they should have many. Yet do I believe, nevertheless, that, as in the same place he forbade kings to have many horses, that is, too great a multitude, lest he should put his trust in them, rather than in God, for otherwise they were allowed to have many horses, even so they were, here there is a lacuna in the text, forbid to have many wives, seeing David, a most holy man, had many, but that they should not have an immoderate multitude, especially such as were heathens and worshippers of false gods. To return, therefore, to our business, tis not credible that Paul feared, lest Timothy should choose for bishops such as were Gentiles or Jews not baptized. They were therefore in the church of Christ, and among the Christians such as had more wives than one. And because from among them a bishop was to be chosen, he would not have him choose one that had diverse wives. But if to keep more wives than one had been contrary to the law of God, as you say it is, and the first wife only were right and true, the rest harlots, it is not credible that the Christians would have baptized any one that had plurality of wives unless he had put away all saving his first. And if that had been the practice, it had been in vain for Paul to command that he that was to be chosen bishop should be the husband of one wife, seeing Christians out of the number of whom the bishop was chosen had but each of them one apiece. But this I much marvel at, that many who have sometimes written and do believe that to have more wives than one is repugnant to the divine law, both moral and natural, and yet, in expounding Paul, they say that he is writing to Timothy, warns him to take heed that he choose not a bishop that had a plurality of wives, whence it follows that seeing election was not to be made of any out of the church of God, that there were in God's church such as had more wives than one, and consequently counted it not unlawful to have more. Otherwise, if they had counted it unlawful, as they did not baptize or admit unto the Lord's Supper any man that kept a concubine, unless he would forsake her, in like manner they would not have baptized, nor admitted to the supper, nor suffered amongst them such as had many wives, unless they would divorce all save the first. Achinus, but what do you say to Paul, who wills and commands that every man should have his own wife? For in saying his own wife he excludes wives. Telepolygamus, some say his meaning is, let every man have his own wife, that is, his own, not another man's, and nor only one. As if some father, making show of his daughter, should say, this is my own daughter, not denying that he has more daughters, that are likewise his own. Hoginus. In the same place, the same Paul commands that the wife have her own proper husband, that is to say, such a wife as is proper to him alone and not in common with other wives. Whence it follows that as a woman ought to be proper to her husband and not to belong to other husbands, so the man ought to be appropriated to his first wife and not common to others provided you will, as you ought, expound the words of Paul, so as he may not contradict himself. Telepolygamus. Paul does not there dispute whether an husband may have plurality of wives or no, but his intent is to show that such men as have not the gift of continence should take them wives, and that women, in the like case, should marry. Oginus. Is it possible that you should not see that plurality of wives is repugnant to the matrimonial contract, in which the man grants his wife and the woman, her husband, an honest use of their respective bodies for ever. For which cause also Paul says that neither the man nor the woman have power over their own bodies, but each of one another's. And in case a man have given the honest use of his body to his wife, he can no longer give it to another, because he has already given it to the first. Telepolygamus, yes, by the permission of the first he may, as Abraham did, when by the permission of Sarah he married Hagar, and consequently by permission of the first and second he may marry a third, which is true of other men as well as Abraham, especially the wives being instructed that it is no sin for their husbands, with their consent, to marry other wives. Achinus, do you believe that David, when he married Bathsheba, did it with consent of his other wives, and that others who married diverse wives did so likewise? 
telepolygamous. Suppose they did not, yet were not their marriages the less true and lawful, for it was then a thing commonly known, and confirmed by example, that it was lawful for a man to have many wives. Therefore, when a man, by marriage, gave the use of his body to his wife, he did not so totally give the same as to bereave himself of all power to give it to other wives also, which the wives knew well enough by the public custom then in force, and thereunto the wives did silently give consent, seeing their husbands married them, with this condition being understood. Their marriages, therefore, were good and lawful. Hercinus, an husband cannot marry a second wife without detriment of his first. It is not therefore credible that wives did in their hearts consent that their husbands should marry others. Telepolygamus, it is possible that my wife may prove barren, in which case it is her duty to consent that I should take another. Yea, and of her own consent to exhort me thereunto, as Sarah did of old. And if she would not approve thereof, this will of hers were unjust, and so it were lawful for her husband to marry another, contrary to her unjust mind. Also, when a woman is with child, and sometimes after she is brought to bed, seeing she is then unfit for procreation, as also when she is old and sick, her husband may without injury to her have to do with another wife. Yea, though a man's wife were sound and fit for generation, yet she ought to take it in good part, if enjoying the company of her husband at some certain times, as it is with other living creatures, she leave it free for him to enjoy the carnal acquaintance of his other wives. Hercinus, do you think it lawful for one wife to have many husbands? Telepolygamus. No. Hercinus. And yet there are sick men as well as sick women. Also, a woman is able to have to do with more men than a man can with women. Whence it seems more just for one woman to have diverse husbands, or at least less unjust, than for a man to have many wives. Telepolygamus. Nay, rather, since matrimony is chiefly ordained for procreation's sake, and a man having many wives may in a short time have many more children than a woman which has a plurality of husbands, it is more equitable that a man have many wives than that a woman have many husbands. But the chief causes why women may not have many husbands, and yet men may have many wives, are these, first of all, because if women should have many husbands, there would follow great disturbance and confusion in the world. For seeing no husband could certainly know that his children are his own, he might always suspect that they were some other husbands rather than his, and consequently he would not bring them up, nor instruct them, nor take such care for them, as now he does, knowing they are his own, though born of diverse wives. Perhaps also, being unassured that they are his own, he would not make them his heirs. Another cause why it is lawful for men to have many wives, but not for women to have many husbands, is this. The husband is his wife's head, and has authority and command over her, as being her superior, for which cause he may have diverse wives, provided he can well rule and instruct them. Nor is it a monstrous but a comely thing for to have many members in one body, though there be but one head. But if the body should have many heads, it would be a monster. So for one husband to have many wives is not monstrous, but for one wife to have many husbands is monstrous. And therefore, as there would be dissension and discord, if in one body there were many heads, and they should be of contrary minds, as might well happen, so would there be discords, perturbations, and great inconveniences, if should have plurality of husbands, seeing it might happen, that they should will things contrary, and command their wives to do them. Hocinus. If we regard discords and inconveniences, we shall find they have been sometimes exceeding great, because one man has had two wives, as we see in the example of Sarah and Hagar, Leah and Rachel, Hannah and Penina, and others. Amongst her were continual dissensions, which I conceive God did therefore suffer, to show that he was not pleased that one man should have more than one wife. Telepolygamus. Although among the firstborn and other brethren many times grievous discords have arose, as appears in Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob, and many others, it is not therefore displeasing to God that fathers should have many sons, as also between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, though there is many times little quiet, yet is not matrimony therefore displeasing to God. In like manner, although among diverse wives of the same husband, there has seldom been good arrangement, yet cannot either marriage in general or marriage of sundry wives be condemned, but only those wives who were not so well disposed as they ought to have been. Achenus. Christians ought in this life to be condemners of pleasures, and to have more of the spirit than those men had which lived under the Old Testament, and therefore, though they had many wives, one apiece ought verily to content us. Telepolygamus, 
I have already declared and told you to cohabit with plurality of wives is no unlawful thing, and that it may consist with the greatest degree of faith and perfection, and therefore I cannot tell you how you can be assured that some Christians are not called by God to cohabit with diverse wives, as well as some Jews of old were called by him thereunto. Okinus, say what you will, to have more wives than one is a thing filthy and dishonest. Telepolygamous, there are two things which bring you into that error. The first is custom, for if it were the custom for men to have more than one, it would not seem to you blameworthy. Another is a feigned kind of holiness which makes the having more wives than one seem to you unlawful, though it be no whit repugnant to the holy scriptures. Yea, and those that have more wives than one are wont to be more grievously punished than they should be if they kept a thousand concubines. Achenus, tis hard for one man to content one woman, and you would have it lawful for him to have more. Telepolygamous, an husband is not obliged to satisfy all the carnal desires of his wife, but such only as are moderated with reason. Okinus, under the Old Testament, when there were few men in the world, it was peradventure expedient for men to have more wives, but now the world is full of people, it is not expedient. Telepolygamous, in the first place, you know not whether men, if they had more wives, would have more children than they have, or if they should beget more children, as is very likely. How know you that the fruits of the earth will not suffice to afford them all that should be necessary for their livelihood and all other occasions? For the same God that gave increase of men would likewise supply plenty of... Here there is a lacuna in the text. To nourish and maintain them, but suppose you were assured they should perish with famine, yet the souls of men are of so great price that we should no ways hinder their existence, especially if we be called thereto by God, as those holy men of old were, who had plurality of wives." Okinus, in these days a Christian ought not to have a plurality of wives, for if no other cause at least to avoid the offence which might thence arise, seeing all Christians do account the having of more wives than one to be a most filthy and diabolical thing. Telepolygamous, even as although men should account matrimony an unlawful thing, yet ought you not to be moved with their offence taken thereat, but to marry, if need were, so ought you to marry more than one, if need be, or you be called thereunto by divine impulse. Achenus. A single man might indeed in such a case marry to avoid fornication, although men should be therewith offended, especially being called by God thereunto. But he that has one already needs not marry another, nor will God thereunto call him. Telepolygamous. Nay, verily, if his wife be sick or other impediments shall happen, so that he cannot enjoy her and be incontinent, he must of necessity to avoid fornication marry another. Add hereunto that God does not call men to marry only for the avoidance of fornication, but chiefly for propagation, as of old he called Abraham and other holy men. Okinus, shall I make it clear and manifest to you that the having more wives than one is a thing forbidden? Christ says, if any man put away his wife, save for adultery, and shall marry another, he commits adultery. But if a man might have more wives than one, he should not commit adultery, as Christ says, whether he put away his former wife or no. Telepolygamous, no man can expound those words of Christ better than Christ himself, who in another place explaining the said words says, Whosoever shall put away his wife save for adultery causes her to commit adultery, that is to say, he gives occasion to his wife, so unjustly being put away to commit adultery, for the wife, being by that means deprived of her true husband, cannot marry any other, her former husband living, but she shall commit adultery. Christ does not therefore say, if any man put away his wife, not for adultery, and marries another, he commits adultery, but that he gives occasion to the repudiated wife to commit adultery. Achenus, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke record that Christ said, if any man put away his wife and marry another, he commits adultery, that is to say, by marrying that other. But if his intent was to show that by unjustly putting her away, he gave her occasion to commit adultery, it had been sufficient to have said, If any one put away his wife, not adding, and marry another. Christ therefore by those words of his in the fifth of Matthew did not intend to explain that passage which is recorded in the nineteenth chapter of the said evangelist. Only he said, If any put away his wife, not for adultery, he makes her commit adultery. But in the nineteenth of Matthew he says another thing, viz. that if he marry another in the same kind, he commits adultery, because the first was his wife, and he ought not to have more than one. Add hereunto that the words of Christ in his Sermon upon the Mount were uttered before those were, 
by which he answered the Pharisees when they asked him whether a man for every cause might put away his wife. Those former words, therefore, cannot be an exposition of those who are spoke afterwards. Telepolygamus. Whether the latter words were an exposition of the former or no, it satisfies me that his meaning is one and the same in both places, viz. that if any man put away his wife without just cause, he occasions her to commit adultery. And as for those words which in the nineteenth chapter are added over and above, Christ added them to show that a wife unjustly divorced, if she marry another man, commits adultery, though at the same time her former husband marry another wife, seeing the first matrimony is not void, but remains in force. His meaning, therefore, is this. If he put her away unjustly, though he marry another, yet he gives her, that is put away, occasion to commit adultery. Aquinas, this interpretation of yours is so forced and strained that it is in danger of breaking. Moreover, we may see in creatures irrational that their males have their females, with whom alone they couple, as we see in the birds, and much fitter it is for men, especially Christians, to have the like. Telepolygamus, that is true only in such like creatures whose propagation is not very needful to the maintenance of the life of man, but if you observe, you shall find that one cock has many hens, one bull many cows, and so in other creatures which are profitable to mankind. If therefore God has ordained for the commodity of mankind that one cock should have many hens, much more has he ordained that one man should have many wives for the propagation of men whom he so highly prizes and so dearly loves. Aquinas, if none of those live creatures you speak of were gvelt, and they should all converse together, you should find every male with his proper female, and men ought to do the same much more. But now, many of the males being gvelt and separated, if none of those live creatures you speak of were gelt, and they should all converse together, you should find every male with his proper female, and men ought to do the same much more. But now many of the males being gelt and separated, if one male couple with diverse females, it follows not therefore that it should be lawful for one man to have many wives. God put into the ark of Noah just so many males as females to show that every male ought to have only his own single female. Telepolygamus, if there were in the world as many men as women, I confess it were expedient that every man should have his own single wife, but seeing the number of women is greater, I conceive it fit that one man have many wives, for it is not in vain that God makes more women. If there were in the world, for example's sake, only three hundred women, and as many men, and every man should have one woman, they could not so soon propagate their kind, as if of six hundred, four hundred were women, and two hundred men, every one of which should have diverse women. For this cause, therefore, God ordained that the number of women should be greater than the number of men. The life of one man equals that of two women. Aquinas, in the first place, I do not believe that you know there are more women in the world than men. Perhaps it seems so to you, because commonly we rejoice at the birth of boys and grieve at the birth of girls. But though there be more women born into the world, yet they live not long, for the most part, by reason of the more tender constitution of their bodies. Add hereunto that many more men perish than women by wars, shipwreck, and the sword of justice. That reason, therefore, does not prove polygamy or plurality of wives. Moreover, the love of carnal society is a most violent passion, and if a dishonest love cannot endure a rival, much less can that which is honest. Telepolygamous, holy love rather extends to all, even our enemies. Hokinus, Jacob was an holy man, and he loved barren Rachel, more than fruitful Leah. So also Elkanah loved Hannah that was barren, more than Penina that was fruitful. Solomon also said that his beloved was one. It is therefore an hard thing to share out a man's love amongst many wives, which notwithstanding must be done in polygamy. When a man has but one wife, mutual love is better preserved than if he had more, and if any falling out happen, reconciliation is more easily made. Where there are many wives, there are diverse understandings, diverse constitutions, distractions, and discords. Telepolygamus, if there were a call from God, there would be his blessing. Polygamy is no enemy to charity, and therefore if any man should have plurality of wives and love were wanting between them, that were not the fault of polygamy, but of the said wives. Aquinas, if the filthy love of an harlot is oftentimes the cause that a man is content with her alone, much more ought the holy love of wedlock work the same effect. Telepolygamus, we see that filthy love is more effectual in some persons than holy love is in others. 
as also in like manner superstition produces more good works in some than true religion in others all which comes to pass by the instinct of satan Hercinus, that plurality of wives is a thing contrary to natural reason hereby appears in that all nations have always abstained therefrom as from a thing unlawful Telepolygamus, you know that the light of nature, that is to say the law which is imprinted in the hearts of men, is the gift of God, and that it is just, and that the law of Moses is not contrary thereunto, but an explanation thereof. For if the law of Moses were contrary thereunto, God would be contrary to himself, seeing both proceed from God, or rather both are one and the same law. And therefore, if plurality of wives had been contrary to the judgment of right reason, neither would Moses verily have dissembled the same, neither would those most holy patriarchs have used the same, nor would God have borne with it, God by Moses commanding the Jews that when they came into the borders of the Gentiles they should not imitate their vices, would have named polygamy among other vices, if it had been unlawful, and he would have forbidden the same by Moses, which nevertheless he did not do. We nowhere read that ever God punished any man for having plurality of wives, nor that he ever did by his prophets threaten such as had many wives. If you would have the manners of the Gentiles to be your rule and law, you shall find amongst them much wickedness, and whereas you said that all nations abhorred polygamy, that is false, as appears by the Jews. Also Cremes had two wives, if we believe Terence, also. Here there is a lacuna in the text. As Sallust relates, in a word, Socrates himself, who notwithstanding was the wisest of men, and had much of the light of nature. Hercinus, even wise men sometimes do amiss. Telepolygamus, never any man condemned or reprehended Socrates for having two wives, although for other things he hath been condemned. What needs many words, polygamy, was used as a good thing and very profitable to mankind by furthering propagation, not only among the Jews, but also among the Persians and the Turks likewise. Only in Europe has it been hateful, in which Europe vice has abounded, if not more, yet not a whit less, than in all other parts of the world. Nay, and in the days of old polygamy was commended, even in Europe. Only they would not have in one house many mistresses to rule the family, which was a thing convenient to avoid confusion. Achenus, I will never confess that it is a good thing to have many wives. Telepolygamus, that is because you conceive it is an unlawful conjunction, and you are overpowered with an old custom among the vulgar, which in tract of time has won the favour of the common people and the magistrates, by which it comes to pass that the common opinion prevails more with you than the truth itself. Achenus, but what do you say to the imperial laws which are against you? Telepolygamus, in what place? Achenus, first of all, the emperors Diocletianus and Maximinus do forbid polygamy in these words, that no man within the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire can have two wives, seeing also of the edict of the praetor, such men are branded with infamy, which thing a just judge will not suffer to go unpunished. Also, in the same code, that man doubtless that has two wives at once is accompanied with infamy. Telepolygamus, the authors of the first law, as you say, were Diocletianus and Maximinus. The other is taken out of a certain rescript of Valerianus and Gallienus. Achenus, it is sufficient that being emperors they had power to make laws. It is to be observed that in their days the condition of matrimony in the heathenish empire was such that any man might put away his wife for light and frivolous causes and keep concubines without any shame. Howbeit they had neither the name nor authority of wives. The emperors therefore thus decreed, not because they thought polygamy was unlawful, seeing they allowed many lawful concubines, but they judged it fit that only the first should have the title and authority of a wife, especially seeing they might divorce her if she pleased them not. Achenus, but we see that concubines were forbidden by the emperor Constantine. Telepolygamus, if you well weigh his words, you will find that his intent was that it should be unlawful for him that had a wife to have concubines, not that it was wholly unlawful, but he might not have them with him, that is, in his own house, where his wife dwelt, viz. to avoid brawlings, discords, and contenations, but out of his house he might have as many as he would. Moreover, the Roman Emperor Valentianus, having the same authority and power, did not only permit such as had wives to keep concubines, but many wives also at the same time in the same house, all dignified by the same name and of equal authority. And Valentianus himself at the same time had diverse wives, and thereby the law of Valentianus, which was afterwards made, the former law of Constantine, was abrogated. Achenus, but Justinian in his code makes no mention of that law of Valentianus. Telepolygamus, yet that law of his was doubtless published, 
as appears by the histories add hereunto that besides valentianus it is apparent that constantinus also the son of constantine the great had many wives clotarius also king of france and heribertus and hypericus his sons had plurality of wives i add here there is a lacuna in the text and charles the great of whom Urspagensis witnesseth that they had more wives than one, yea, and Lotarius, and the son of Lotarius, as also Arnulfus, the seventh emperor of Germany, and Frederick Barbarossa, and Philippus Diodatus, king of France, and many more. Nor will I deny that it is a wicked thing to do as some do, who, having wives, leave them, travel into strange countries, and marry others. But I speak of such as take care of both their wives, and are thereunto called by God. Hokinus you suppose that which never was in the world, viz., that any man should be called by God to have two wives. Telepolygamus, even as Abraham, Jacob, and many others were called by God thereunto, so may we. Nor do I see why they had more need of this remedy than we, nor why it was rather their duty to beget and bring up numerous progeny than ours. Achenus, Constantine will not have men to keep plurality of wives, nor will the emperor that now reigns. Telepolygamus, Tell me what is just and fit, and not what men will. The law of nature is unchangeable, and if in the days of Abraham it was agreeable to reason to have plurality of wives, as a thing honest and just, otherwise we may assure ourselves Abraham would not have married above one, and therefore we must confess that it is at this day a thing fit and just, and so it was in the days of Constantine, for though he were an emperor, yet could he not make that to be unjust which was just in itself. Doubtless that ancient church of Christ had the knowledge of divine matters, and yet neither that church nor the emperors of those times did condemn or punish polygamy. But men had rather seem to be good than be so indeed, since they are so great haters of plurality of wives, but not of adultery. Finally, to condemn polygamy is for a man to prefer himself before God, who never condemned the same, and to strive to be more perfect than he. I spare to say that I may not allow of the laws of the emperors in cases of matrimony, seeing they refer the business to the ecclesiastic laws. Achenus, if you will be tried by them, I am victor. Telepolygamus, bring one canon that makes for you. Achenus, in the times of the fathers, polygamy was accounted so filthy and so notoriously and manifestly abominable that they did not think fit to condemn it by words. Telepolygamus, but I, for my part, am verily persuaded that those fathers of the ancient church were contented with the canon of Paul, who would have the ministers of the church to be contented with one wife, not because it was in itself unlawful to have more, but that they might the better execute their office, but he allowed others to live according as they found themselves inwardly moved by God. Achenus, and yet plurality of wives was forbidden in the third and seventh Neo-Caesarean council. Telepolygamus, I say it was never forbidden, neither in them nor in any other. Achenus, sure I am, they ordained a penalty for polygamists, which they would never have done unless they had counted it unlawful to have more wives than one. Moreover, they forbade all priests to be present at the marriage of him that would have more wives than one. Telepolygamus, true, but they did not forbid polygamy itself. Achenus, they forbid it sufficiently when they ordained punishments for it. Telepolygamus, though you read all the councils over, you shall never find polygamy forbidden. Nor can that be said to be the reason, because they conceived it was forbidden in the Holy Scriptures, for neither is it forbidden, as we have shown already, and in the seventeenth canon of the Apostles it is decreed that a man having two wives should be removed from the episcopal and priestly function, and from all other ecclesiastical offices. But if the authors of those canons had seen that polygamy was repugnant to the scriptures, to charity, and the common good of mankind, they would have excommunicated such as had two wives, nor would they only have kept them from the communion, but they would also have punished them grievously. But those apostolical persons, as Paul had done before them, did only forbid the ministers of the church to have more wives than one, not as if it were a thing repugnant to common honesty, but because it would draw them away and divert them from spiritual exercises. But because afterward men began by little and little to turn aside from the right way, so that many now fell to account marriage unlawful, they were not ashamed to write that a man's first wife being dead it was adultery and not marriage to take another, touching which matter you may see what Gratian writes. So also Jerome and Tertullian interpret that saying of Paul and the apostles as if his intent had been that he which had two wives, though one after another, might not be a minister in the church of God, as also he that married a widow or a divorced wife, which is observed at this day by those most holy men, Sir Reverence, the Papists, 
who notwithstanding create men of extraordinary and noted filthiness for their bishops. But mark what I shall say, the life of a courtier and a soldier is not sinful in itself, but many may be called by God to embrace the same, and yet in the twelfth canon of the Nicene Council it was decreed that those men should be severely punished who, having left the wars, should become soldiers again, notwithstanding in those times war was seldom made, saving against idolaters and infidels. In like manner, though they decreed penalties for such as had second wives, yet is not bigamy therefore sinful, nor does it follow, but that many may by divine instinct be called thereunto. There are many such canons, especially concerning matrimony, which want amendment, nor are we tied by any canons but such as have their foundation in the word of God. The fathers have many times erred as being men, and sometimes swerving from the rule of God's word. Moreover, we ought to believe that Paul taught the Ephesians for example's sake, and the rest of the churches all things necessary to salvation, as himself testifies, and yet he taught them not that any were to be tied to one wife excepting ministers of the church. Achenus. He might therefore peradventure do that to the intent that others by their example might by little and little be brought to practice the same. Telepolygamus. In the first place, that which you say is not founded upon any word of God without which it seems to me an impious thing to bind men's consciences. Moreover, everything that is convenient for bishops ought not to be propounded as an example for all to follow. Ochenus, yet it is much to say that the church has erred for the space now of a thousand two hundred years in punishing bigamy. Telepolygamus, that error is not to be attributed to the church of God, but to men who in the church have as much erred in forbidding priests to marry, yea, and I would have you to take notice that the Neo-Caesarean council decreed not that the second wife should be divorced, nor that the second was no true marriage. Achenus, the council declared that sufficiently by decreeing penalties for such as had two wives. Telepolygamus, Augustine judges that man to sin, who, having made a vow of chastity, marries a wife, and yet he accounts it true marriage, and that it ought not to be made void. This argument, therefore, is of no force. The council enacted penalties for such as had two wives, and therefore the second was no true marriage. Moreover, though above a thousand years are passed since penalties were enacted against such as had two wives, Yet is it not above four hundred years since that decree was first received by the Italians, Spaniards, and Germans, for it is but an humane constitution, and the bishops would have exclaimed against Valentianus for his plurality of wives, but that he had the holy scriptures on his side, and notwithstanding they reprehended such as had more than one wife, as Augustine and Boniface did, as persons that seemed overindulgent in the flesh. They did not therefore excommunicate them, or reckon them for such as could not be saved. Ambrose was a very sharp reprover of sin, yet we do not anywhere read that he reproved Valentianus for having two wives. Yea, and the said Ambrose, reprehending Justinia, his second wife, for being an Arian, must have reproved her also for being no true wife, but a concubine, which notwithstanding he did not do. It is likewise recorded that Leo V, when he heard that a certain bishop in Africa had two wives, he only decreed that by reason of the words of Paul he should be degraded from that honour but not that he should put away his second wife, or be otherwise punished for having two. Gregory likewise, Bishop of Rome, writing to Boniface, who was sent into Germany to teach Christianity an hundred and twenty years after the Nativity of Christ, beseeches him to take care that such as had many wives and all were dead save one might content themselves with her alone and marry no more, so that he exhorts men to shun plurality of wives just as he should exhort them to embrace a single life which can be understood of none, but such as are called by God to such a kind of life. The true ecclesiastical canons which oblige us in their observance are such as have their foundation in God's word. But to go, read the epistle which Gregory the third of that name, Bishop of Rome, wrote to the foresaid Bonifacius. There you shall find him right to this effect. If any man have a wife, which by reason of some bodily infirmity cannot afford her husband due benevolence, he shall do well to abstain from her. But if he cannot contain, for that is a gift of God not given to all, it is better that he should marry another wife than burn, provided he allow his first wife all necessary maintenance. Than which, what could be expressed more clearly? Achenus, all that you can say, though you talk till doomsday, will never make me think it fit and lawful for a man to have more than one wife. Telepolygamus, suppose there are more women than men, what shall the poor women do in this case? Achenus, they must do just as the men should do, in case there were more men than women. Viz, pray to God to give them the gift of continence. Telepolygamus, in case a man is by God called to a married condition, and hath not the gift of continence, 
to live a single life, it would be in vain for him to pray to God that he might have the gift to live without a wife, for in my opinion he would never obtain his request, seeing God calls him to marry. Achenus, the whole world has believed that plurality of wives is unlawful, nor can any man have more than one wife without giving the greatest offence imaginable, which all men ought to shun. Moreover, it is the will of God that we obey our magistrates, and they are so far from consenting to polygamy, that they will put him to death, that shall have more than one wife. Telebaligamus, but not if he have many concubines or whores, if any man being moved by divine instinct to marry diverse wives, and it should be no sin so to do, if he married them, it were a scandal taken, as the schools speak, and not given, also he might, to avoid scandal, marry his second wife privately. Achenus, but such things are hardly practicable, and if he should be often seen in company of his second wife, men would take offence, as supposing her to be his concubine. I shall therefore continually exhort all men to avoid polygamy, and truly I exhort you to do the same. The papists themselves do vow to live single, and shall we that are regenerate, spiritual, and evangelical men marry more wives than one? Telepolygamus, just, and how honest, that single life of theirs is, all the world takes notice. The law itself condemns barren matrimony, so far is it from not condemning voluntary and barren single life. Now I speak expressly of such as have not the gift of continency, nor are called to a single life. The Romans did punish such as lived single, and rewarded those who by abundance of children did augment the commonwealth, and Lycurgus also, and Ulpianus decreed the same. Now what more blessed a thing can there be than the preservation of humankind, which would wholly perish were it not for marriage? A man cannot transmit to posterity a more honourable memorial of his name than by leaving behind him children, virtuously educated. And what greater folly can be imagined than under a show of holiness to shun holy matrimony as a thing profane, which notwithstanding has been ordained by God, is dictated by nature, persuaded by reason, confirmed by Christ, praised by authors, sacred and profane, commended by the laws, approved by the consent of all nations, and whereunto we are invited by the examples of good and holy men. What more barbarous and inhumane than to loathe matrimony, the desire whereof is implanted in us by nature? What more unthankful to the common nature of the world and mankind than not to beget children, as our ancestors and parents have begotten us? For my part I make account that such men are murderers of as many as they might have begotten, in case they had embraced matrimony, unless peradventure they are carried by a divine impulse to live single. Questionless, it is a kind of manslaughter, not only by medicaments to cause abortion and barrenness, but also, without very just cause, to shun marriage. Okinus, I do not condemn matrimony, namely the having of one wife, but the having of two or more. Telepolygamus, but what advice will you give me? Okinus, that you marry no more wives, but pray to God for the gift of continence. Telepolygamus, what if he will not give it me? Achenus, he will if you pray in faith. Telepolygamus, what if he neither give me the gift nor faith to ask it? Achenus, if you shall then do that, to which God shall incline you, so that you be sure you are led by divine instigation, you shall not sin, for it can be no error to obey God. Other advice I cannot give you, and therefore I bid you farewell, and promise you that I will seek God in your behalf. Telepolygamus, and that is it which I beseech you to do, that I may not offend God, but that I may give him all honour and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.